If you're used to listening to this podcast on Blog Talk Radio, we're moving. You can find content and podcast streaming on talentculture.com or iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite place to listen in. Starting next week, our show will no longer air on Blog Talk Radio, so please follow us and continue the conversation. On today's Work Trends podcast, we're talking how to have fun with Nick G. Welcome to the Work Trends Podcast from Talent Culture. I'm your host, Megan M. Biro. Every week, I interview interesting people and brands who are reimagining work. For more information, be sure to check us out at talentculture.com. And join us live on Twitter every Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern using the hashtag Work Trends. Welcome, everyone, to the March 7th, 2018 edition of Work Trends. Hashtag Work Trends. Don't forget that. Today's topic is deliver happiness, increase profits. According to our Work Trends guest today, Nick G, I'll call him. He's so cool, by the way. I'm excited to have him here. Research continues to show that happy employees lead to bottom line business improvement. The workplace evolution, everybody, right? Spurred by those millennials who will compromise 75% of the workplace by 2025 means that companies that don't embrace it, they're going to be history. Like I'm just, I know I've been saying this for a while and I'm going to keep saying it. It's just reality, right? So Nick G is the founder of the fun department, a consulting and training company that has been featured on CNN, BBC news, Washington post, TEDx, and numerous other media outlets. He is known, get this everybody as the godfather of fun. Um, he began his company after experiencing firsthand the enhanced culture and business results of fun. How cool is that? During his 20-year corporate management tenure with a company that embraced the work hard, play hard culture. He is also the co-author of the book, Playing It Forward. Welcome, Nick. Thank you, Megan. Great to be with you. And how do you pronounce your last name? It's Giannolis or anything G- close uh, to G- no Liz. You got it. Well, what? what's happening in your world? Where, where are you today? Life is good. I am in Wilmington, Delaware, which is uh, world headquarters for the fun department, little Wilmington of all places, but it's home base for uh, our company and where I am today. So very cool. I'm home for a change because I travel quite a bit. I bet you do. You're a busy guy. Busy guy these days. Yes. <clears throat> so tell us what's exciting to you about this topic and subsequently what prompted you to write the book playing it forward. Mm. So yeah, so the genesis for the company and ultimately the book was born out of the experience mentioned earlier. So working in a corporate environment with a work hard, play hard culture. And I just gravitated towards the play hard, to be honest, because I already knew how to work hard. (laughs) But I was... (laughs) I was fascinated by how this company had such high productivity, great retention, um, you know, profitability in a very competitive industry. So my theory or hypothesis, if you will, is that it was really based on on this culture of play and fun. And so I incorporated it into my own management style and as a young manager, you know, with great success. So it was really working well for me. And then I thought, wow, maybe fun, you know, could be more of a process than an event because we typically did long uh, events after work, a lot of drinking after work. If anybody knows that, that type of fun. <laughs> we, know, we know nothing we, about that here now at Talent that, Culture. Some of our guests know. Um, yeah. But and you know we still do that from time to time but but what i realized is that fun that happened after work um on a, especially on a weekend became less and less attractive over the years and nationally that was the case uh the statistics bore that out so i thought why not take out take those uh euphoric but fleeting feelings that come from bigger events and break them up consistently into small pieces during the course of the year and treat fun as a process on company time And that was what I did. So I started a committee and we planned these fun events and it was wildly successful. And I thought, wow, this is a business. Everybody should have a fun department. Um, So I started, uh, that was the genesis, obviously, for the name of the company and and starting the company. So it started more on, on theory and a hunch. There wasn't a lot of data, but thankfully there is today. 
And what what year are we talking? I mean, you've had a 20 year career. Give our audience an idea of context. Yeah. So I'm going to really age myself here. So 20 years I was with this company in this uh, company called United Electric. And um, and the company, the fund department is 12 years old. So I started in around 05, 06 is when the company actually started. So 20 years prior to that, I was with this company, United, and and really experienced firsthand, you know, creating yeah. fun in the workplace without a lot of experience or certainly the knowledge that I have today. Yeah. And there's no question this is a cultural um, idea of, you know, how people look at fun now versus what they were doing 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. Um, It's just completely changed. So but I think fun is something that's timeless and I hope it's endless to everybody. So utilize the work, the, that hashtag work trends. If you want to share thoughts about this concept, by the way. So tell me, um, why doesn't the traditional nose to the grindstone workplace culture not work well in today's workplace? Well, the workplace has really changed dramatically. Um, you know, we refer to it as the movement. Some people call it the, you know, workplace revolution. But certainly the influx of millennials has had a major impact. And I know some people are tired of hearing about millennials. Yeah. I happen to love, um, you know, that population. And I, I love that they're change agents. And the first population that is, you know, you know really demanding some change and not in an obnoxious way, just the fact that they... Um, You know, they want a sense of purpose and, you know, collaboration and recognition, all the things that we all want. These are universal things. Doesn't matter how old you are. Um, Everybody would like to have fun and flexibility and some of the characteristics that are typically associated with millennials. But they are driving a lot of the change simply because they are making a choice to work in an environment where there's a great culture and, um, you know, fun environment versus a traditional hierarchical uh, business uh, setting, which which is really becoming passe. So. That's that probably, you know, um, represents most of the change that's that's gone on. But it's been brewing for some time. And yeah, I was just going to say that, Nick. I mean, this, you know, a lot of people like to say the millennials and frankly, like half of my friends are millennials. I right. happen to be a Gen Xer. Right. Um, uh-huh. There is some context that goes into that. Like, when were you born? What did you experience when you were coming of age? How has your workplace or workforce or employee experience shaped some of that? Right. But I think, you know, we're sort of at a place now where, you know, I think millennials are just getting tired of being called millennials. I think we're all in this together personally. Um, But there's no there's no question that generational expectations helped change this. I also personally believe that digital media helped (laughs) Mm -hmm. push this along and sort of get it into the forefront of the um, active conversation. So listen, let's uh, let's talk about data a little bit, because a few years ago, the University of Warwick in the UK conducted a survey to measure the impact of happiness on employee productivity and found a 12 percent increase in productivity among happy workers. And guess what? A 10 percent decrease among unhappy workers. This is just one study of many of how employee attitude affects engagement and productivity. Given this, Nick, why aren't all companies paying attention to the workplace happiness and that that whole thing? And most importantly, how it affects employees? Yeah. So in, in our experience, and I am fascinated by that subject because this, be, you know, comes naturally to me and other, you know, other people in, in this movement, but there's still a relatively small percentage of companies that practice this and do it well. But what um, what is getting everyone's attention is is this data. And um, we get some panic calls now from companies going, oh, my gosh, you know, my competitor is hiring all the best and brightest. I can't even attract these young people anymore. What do I do? Get a foosball table? I mean, like they're they're literally. And, and by the way, that's the right. lamest idea in the world, everybody. <laughs> foosball is very 10 years ago. Just saying. <laughs> Exactly. So, you know, I think that um, this is such a major, you know, culture shift. And as a lot of the boomers are exiting the work, the workplace, and they are in leadership roles, um, you know, this change occurs over the period of, you know, a decade or so. And most people, too, are 
put off a bit by thinking that, oh, I have to look like Google or I have to look like um, you know, Facebook or Zappos or you know one of these other companies that get a lot of attention. But it's not necessary to make your workplace look like that or to, or to incorporate, you know, some fun and humor, play, happiness in the workplace. It's not necessary to buy stuff or recreate your, your physical space. So that's what we encourage people is that, you know, this should be, you know, small organic things that you can do um, to make major changes and impact. And people are, are usually very pleased and and uh, that that that's the case. But they just it's just a lack of information. They don't know that there is an alternative to traditional team building. Well, and it's also fun has to come from a real place. You can't sure. force fun. <laughs> you just sure. can't. You it, you could try, but a foosball table ain't going to cut it, right? right? So, you know, now over to the flip side of this, we all know that companies that seem to do everything right, because frankly, they are always part of the conversation when discussing brands with mm -hmm. a step, stellar reputation, right? In addition to being companies others brands want to emulate. So tell us a few of them and how they built fun into their business model, even before they became successful. And I mean, I know, I know you're going to bring up Zappos. That's mm -hmm. cool. But you know, if you've got examples of other companies that are maybe a little more under the radar, or we've never heard of, bring it on, Nick, we'd love to hear it. Sure. So, yeah, there's a couple names that always get everyone's attention, you know, Google's Zappos. Uh, and, I, you know, I'll mention Southwest Airlines because they, they've probably been at this longer than, you know, than anyone. And, um, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with Southwest or, you know, their culture, but, you know, a lot of people have you know, very pleasant things to say about their experience with Southwest Airlines. And, you know, the customer service level is exceptional and and they have consistently outperformed through all of the changes in the airline industry um, over the years. They have consistently outperformed and they've been profitable all this time. So <clears throat> that's one company that's recognizable. <clears throat> what I would tell you is that there are thousands of companies that you've never heard of, you know, whose names um, you would not recognize who are doing this very successfully, small companies. Um, medium-sized company, any vertical market that you can imagine. And it, it's it's becoming, while again, still by a percentage of total companies, it's still relatively small, but it is growing, growing quickly. So we, we um, you know, interface a lot with, you know, bigger name uh, companies. And, you, you know, you'll recognize major hospital systems that are doing this. Um, it's it's really big in in patient care uh, these days uh, to to make sure that staff at hospitals are you know reducing stress and being able to really take care of patients. Um, so big in hospital systems, but all you know all kinds of industries and and different size companies. Speaking of Zappos. Yeah. I understand that you recently partnered with Delivering Happiness Zappos. So do tell us, um, because, you know, obviously I've been talking about Zappos for what feels like several years now, and that's a good thing. Tell us more about this <laughs> partnership and what it has done for yourself, your brand, and Zappos. Yeah, so so I've admired that brand for, you know, many years since I started in this business. And, you know, Tony Shea started that company you know, with culture and happiness in mind. So there's nothing more generic than online shoes, right? Nothing sexy or glamorous about that business. But he built it with the idea in mind that I'm going to create, you know, this amazing workplace, you know, that will will lead to, you know, wow, customer experiences. And um, so I've, I've, you know, been admiring that brand. I've been a fan of Zappos. And I shop with them all the time. And the one time I had a bad well, not even a bad customer experience. I, you know, they shipped the wrong product. The the um, their response was so delightful that you know I. What I, was it? I almost wished that it would be either they you know there'd be another um, yeah. You know, but it was, you know, I got this call from, you know, this representative and it, it was in this whole Western theme, howdy partner, you know, how's your day going, you know, and <laughs> the engaging fun experience. And they not only replaced my shoes for free and they gave me another pair and, you know, all this stuff. Um, but I, I just have always admired the brand. And 
as what I love about our industry is that we all share, right? So, you know, people that are trying to move this forward are very willing to, you know, share and communicate with each other. So in doing so with, with uh, Jen Lim at Delivering Happiness and some of her associates, you know, we just realized, wow, we are very complementary brands. And while Delivering Happiness kind of works from the top leadership down, we we kind of live in the what, what they call the live and sustain portion of a contract after after a customer has established their core values and their culture and their culture teams we come in to help those values come to life um, so it's really a you know an awesome partnership um, you know we're proud to be you know partners with them and we, we're working on some really exciting things together so the industry in general is is you know doing some great things and I, I see a really bright future this is a win-win you know companies win employees win um, you know companies become you know more profitable and productive like it's you know it's good for our economy it's good for everybody So, I mean, I also believe that fun is a shared experience, and I think we share in a lot of different ways, and I think sharing means something probably a little bit different to me than it does you and other people. Um, Why is it in your viewpoint, and how did you come to develop this specific concept? Like, what was that about? (laughs) <laughs> it's actually a cool story. So um, a gentleman, young man who worked for us for years and still with us, Nat Neasley, um, you know, brilliant guy. And I sent him out years ago, probably, you know, 11 years ago. And I said, Nat, go find me Universal Fun. You know, we're just going to create things around those 10 things and, you know, we'll be wildly successful. And Nat loves to do research. And he came back and, you know, months later and said, Nick, I've b- good news, bad news. There's no such thing as universal fun. That's the bad news. The good news is the shared experience I found is a way to connect people yeah. and, and find these common experiences. So um, it became kind of the basis for really for what we do. We start there. We start with what's fun for you as an individual and then what's fun for a a, a department, a division, a company. And we find those shared experiences. So it's no more forced family fun or these creepy, uh, weird team building things. (laughs) It's really based on what's fun for you and and your culture, your environment. And it's going to be different. It will most likely look different between the sales department and yeah. You no, know, and and uh, operations. That's just, and that's fine. It's okay. So let people have, you know, the brand of fun that works for them in the context of their culture. So that's where we start. And we've done this exercise, shared experience for two people for two thousand. We've done it thousands of times, and it and it works every time. So it's um. That's where it really looks different. Um, You know, our model is where we really start with that um, basis of what's fun for you individually and how can we connect that to you as a company and and, and work from there. Well, and it's also about flexing up. Like, I remember one time somebody was like, let's go play paintball. And I was like, paintball, huh? (laughs) Not sure I'm really digging this, but you know what? I I flexed up and said, I'm going to just give this a shot. No pun intended, by the way. Um, (laughs) And it was like, it it was fun. Like, I didn't think it would be fun, but I'm sure that that happens in these scenarios quite a bit. Like, do you see trends with, say, what software engineering teams see as fun versus the sales teams? Yeah. Tell us what we're doing. What are people doing for fun, basically? So all kinds of things. And and one of the really important elements of, you know, this shared experience is we 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 call it all inclusive and non-threatening. So you let people participate at the level they're comfortable with. And I'll t- I use paintball as an example where, you know, that could sound intimidating and scary for some people. Right. But well, especially now, by the way, it's like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, well, right? never a dull moment pretty awful to me. But anyway, um, you know, if ultimately that's what people decided, how could you adapt um, something like paintball that you could play, you know, not on an actual paintball field with rifles and stuff, but how could you adapt that to be something that you could do in an office environment where everyone could participate or someone might just want to 
um, observe or cheer their team on or whatever, but you allow people to participate at the level they're comfortable with. And I, I often use an example of dance because for, you know, some people dance is intimidating. They're not going to do it. But we've, you know, we had a customer who determined that dance was one of the things that they as a company, 150 people found as a common shared experience. And it, and it happened so that, you know, some people like to dance, other people like to watch dancing with the stars or whatever. But that company takes a three o'clock dance stop. Oh, that's awesome. Every, every day they started it once a that's month. That's totally so, awesome. Like, can I, can I show up here? Seriously. <laughs> like I'm a huge dance fan. Um, <laughs> Awesome. See that that's what we want to hear about, right? Uh, yeah. Um and let me ask you this, Nick G. Does this relate to laws of fun and box of fun? Tell us more about that and yes. how that relates. Yeah, so our laws of fun, you know, were really developed over the history of delivering fun in the workplace and delivering a lot of it and things that are universally true about fun in, in the workplace. So laws of fun sounds like an oxymoron, right? Like laws of fun, that doesn't sound I know, right. like that doesn't sound fun, just yeah. saying. But they are the universal truths. And the first one, the very first one is leadership buy-in, right? So when leaders are bought in, we're successful 100% of the time. If leaders are not bought in and we're trying to force it up from the bottom or something, it's about 50 to 60% successful. And it might live in one department or one area where a leader buys in, but it won't translate through the rest of the organization. So leadership buy-in and then consistent, do, doing things consistent on company time and compliant. They're the three C's. So consistent means like once a month, 15 to 30 minutes, once a month is what we recommend. Um, you know, again, compliant with your your culture. And and then we also say, you know, fun for all the senses. So pay, pay attention to things like the environment, you know, maybe step away from your cubicle and go out to the atrium or if it's a beautiful day, go outside. Um, so, you know, it should be fun for all the senses and, you know, it should smell good, look good, taste good, all that. So, um, you know, those are less important than the, than the first four, but that's the, you know, the laws of fun. And then the, uh, the box of fun was really born out of, again, delivering a lot of fun physically in the workplace and knowing what works and what doesn't work. And we took our best ever and we curated those into a box and we ship them to companies. So, you know, instructions and, and, uh, you know, props and supplies. How to have fun. I we, mean, is this funny or what? <laughs> so yeah, everything <laughs> that you need. There you and go. It's a great entryway to experience some fun. They're designed for, you know, 15 to 20 minutes of fun and, um, they're reusable and, and people love them. So, mm -hmm. uh, so we try to find a solution for everybody, you know, so could, we can teach you how to do it, teach your model and process, yeah. ship yeah. you or physically deliver it. Hey, you know, some people need help having fun. Have yeah. at it, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. So listen, you know, you've gotten our listeners' attention today. Um, what can everyone do to get some fun into their organizations? And tell us, is this time consuming and or expensive? Mm, yeah, another yeah, great question. So um, it's not, uh, you know, expensive. Uh, you know, one of the things that we really promote are doing things that are, you know, small, easy and organic that do not require expert facilitation. So when we design and, uh, you know, with with companies in, in a workshop and we're designing activities and maybe football is something that they like, well, we're going to adapt football to a place where everybody can play, it can be in the office, we're going to modify that game to be, you know, t uh, 10 to 15 minutes and, um, you know, easy, accessible with props and supplies that are probably under a hundred dollars, you know, things that you have around the office that you can, you can adapt. And once people get in this creative mindset, we send them, you know, through the paces of identifying the forums, the themes, the activities, and the follow-up, there's the four pillars. They get really proficient, really proficient at designing these programs. They can do it in five minutes or less. So it's following a process. It's easy. It's simple. And it's affordable. So it's not what people perceive as fun necessarily, like these big elaborate team building events. Yeah. 
It's not that. And that's not what employees want anymore. I was just going to say, thank you for bringing, that's so refreshing. People just, nobody wants to feel forced. And to me, it's just always felt forced. So listen, um, thanks for joining us today, Nick, and for bringing some F-U-N fun (laughs) to this week's Work Trends event. We're going to be continuing this conversation immediately following this podcast on Twitter using the hashtag Work Trends. And if you want to throw in there some fun hashtags. We welcome it. Um, So please join Nick and I as we continue this conversation. And last but never, ever least, a big thanks to my talent culture friends and sponsors. Thanks for listening to Work Trends from Talent Culture. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And I'd be really grateful if you took a moment to leave a rating and review on iTunes. It helps other people find our show. If you know someone who would enjoy listening, please share it with them. You can learn more about the future of work at talentculture.com. 